Um, my name is Richard Joy. I'm the executive director of the Urban Land Institute Toronto, or ULI Toronto. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we are a multidisciplinary industry association, a chapter of an international organization that has a, a fairly broad global footprint. Um, Toronto is one of the chapters or district councils um, that actually as a result of uh, most of those district councils are are based around a, a metropolitan region some are are you know provincial or state or even national uh, scale but but usually centered around the major city or cities uh, within that jurisdiction Toronto's uh, is related to um, the GTHA really GG the GGH the greater golden horseshoe now um, and as a result of our uh, incredibly dynamic market as it's been for, you know, really a 20 plus year run. And then even before that, um, we are um, actually one of the very largest chapters. We're rivaling um, the largest chapter, which is largest two chapters or three chapters, which are New York, um, San Francisco uh, and, um, and Washington, which is where head office is actually located, uh, global head office. So. Um, we're, um, is that right? Wow. We're, yeah. Okay. We're, we're over uh, about 2,200 members, uh, New York by comparison is about 2,500 members and they're the very largest. So, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a, or it's a, it's an organ, local chapter that has, uh, really taken storm, uh, uh, in our area. And I think in part because, you know, our, our idea behind the organization besides being multidisciplinary public sector, private sector, and very much with a strong community intersection. That's an increasing frontier for us is to bust outside of our professional bubble and, and be relevant to um, uh, folks who are who are uh, actual living residents uh, or, you know, uh, people within within the city region itself who aren't professionally making their their uh, living out of out of one pursuit or another within our ecosystem. Um, and uh, but but the idea of the mission, the global mission, is to advance the responsible use of land, and that brings us into a lot of different conversations. Uh, what what is the responsible use of land? Uh, and as we're probably seeing right now in the context of uh, this uh, global pandemic that we're in, and the hangover effect uh, afterwards, um, no doubt that answer to what is the responsible use of land is shifting. Um, so that's going to be a very interesting thing to see uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months and years ahead uh, of uh, as we go through this 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 global moment. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about us. Uh, yeah. We don't uh, we don't lobby. We don't uh, take uh, uh, positions per se, but we do try to uh, provoke um, the right kinds of conversations that hopefully lead to better outcomes around public policy, the, the greater good of what can be achieved through city building. I think that was the thing that I found kind of, um, when I first learned what the ULI was, uh, I still didn't really grasp it because the it's the, the responsible use kind of component that like, I was like, is it an advocacy organization? Is it a, but like it, it really does, and forgive me if I'm, I'm kind of extrapolating, but it really does kind of center around, like there's a lot of thought leadership there. You guys release, um, that big, uh, I don't remember the name of the report, the one that's annual. The Emerging, the emerging Trends in Real Estate. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, with PwC, yeah. And then uh, panel discussions and um, kind of networking a lot of, for members. That's right, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of programming, which is probably what most people know us for. But we also do a lot of outreach uh, where we strategically try to intervene uh, with um, uh, often their public sector uh, sponsors who've got a, a, a challenge that they are wrestling with and we can bring um, a, a team of multidisciplinary experts who um, have to have one thing in common, which is no possible interest in the outcome of their recommendations. They can't benefit from them, but they can, but they can generously lend their expertise to help um, wrestle through uh, a particular uh, land use or public policy challenge. And I can give you examples. And sometimes those are local experts. Sometimes those are international experts. We have a very significant educational frontier. In fact, one that has a kind of a neat intersection with with the backdrop of our conversation today, and that's uh, uh, a high school program called Urban Plan, um, which is a, an intensive uh, one month 
uh, module that that takes over a, a geography class or sometimes other other uh, uh, subject matters uh, within the TDSB high school system, um, where we take uh, a class through with our members as participants in the in the program, uh, a really intensive uh, discussion around what. Uh, is a good urban planning, what is good urban development, wrestling with all the conflicting forces that, that present themselves in that kind of equation. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, you know, speaks to a, a really strong educational frontier um, that uh, is another big piece of uh, what we do. Right. And um, of course, there's also the, uh, the meetings, right? The, uh, the large kind of conventions. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Sadly, um, as some of the people on the call may know, uh, the fact um, is that we had, uh, for the very, very first time, um, one of the big um, North American conventions coming to Toronto uh, in uh, May of this year. Um, but uh, obviously, it had to, like many other conventions around the world, it had to be uh, cancelled and it's uh, going to be uh, postponed in the case of Toronto to 2023. So. Um, one of the casualties of uh, this uh, global pandemic is uh, that we uh, we lost our our conference, um, but uh, um, our 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 pain on that front is really pales what's in comparison to what so many other are facing. That we'll you know we'll take that one in stride. Yeah, I was. Uh, I mean, it was obviously it was disappointing, but I was heartening to see that you guys got um, you were able to negotiate the new date. So that's great. I know, uh, you know, from the perspective of working with a firm that has. Uh, you know, a major presence in the States and a major presence in Canada, it was really cool to see um, how many of my American colleagues kind of um, basically had to educate themselves on even more on the Toronto market, um, kind of in anticipation of knowing that there, there were going to be conversations about Toronto and Canada uh, that would be coming up. Uh, so I, I, I do really look forward to, um, you know, the rescheduled date. I think it'll be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I just know how hard you guys have been working on it as well. So uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that is that you know, when you're in Toronto, you 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 have to expect that 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 the rest of the world's taken note of the fact that, you know, for example, we have more cranes in the sky than the top two U.S. cities combined. Um, we've we've we're you know by some measures the fastest growing urban region and. North America and Europe, um, you know, the success on which we've we've managed our growth um, is is you know all these things uh, uh, you would expect to be putting us on a kind of a a global uh, certainly a North American radar, but the reality is is we're in many ways not, and 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 so this was going to be a, a bit of a coming out party we thought for for many. Uh, Americans, especially, uh, to sort of see what we're doing and how we're handling uh, things like suburban intensification, how we're dealing with transit-oriented development, how we're making mixed use and mixed income, and and uh, some of our legacy stories around affordability uh, 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 and so forth. Not to mention the many shared challenges we have around things like affordability as well and and mobility, etc. But but nonetheless, we have a we have a pretty great story for all our challenges, uh, and particularly, I think, in a North American context. And um, I guess we'll have to wait a few more years to, to tell that story. Yeah, it's more more time to build momentum. I yes. Yeah. Um, so let me let me walk you through what we've uh, just to okay. kind of give you a heads uh, a little bit of a uh, what's the word I'm looking for a little background on on what's happened so far. So uh, okay. You are the third person to kind of have a touch on this uh, on this little city that we've got here. It's a, um, a seaside town. We were trying to, um, if you look at the kind of region, because uh, eventually this game does grow to become a, a kind of a regional simulator. So perhaps uh, one city is your kind of downtown core, much like uh, even Toronto. You can make a, a you know kind of a commuter um, side kind of city or an exurb, uh, and then uh, you have your kind of major downtown core or perhaps one of them is kind of a shipping center um, what have you and they all start to interact with each other in that way but for now uh, we tried to emulate we picked a region that kind of emulated the Great Lakes uh, this is supposed to be the ocean but we're going to pretend it's a giant lake for now sure um, and so we started this kind of little coastal city um, and what we had started with was perhaps creating kind of a commercial residential area that will one day grow into a tourist district was kind of the initial vision 
uh, that was uh, my first guest. And then um, Jenny, my second guest, we mostly talked about accessibility. We didn't do so much of the city building that time um, and kind of talked about the limitations of um, Excel. There is no accessibility legislation in a game like this. It's not uh, mm -hmm. granular enough to capture that sort of thing. And the comparison with kind of um, what the built environment in Toronto faces. So sure. what we're looking at now is just a, a small city that is um, in dire need of, uh, they want middle income residential. Um, the demographics of this game are basically, uh, and I, I mentioned this to you in kind of prepping that uh, some of the people watching this are planners who have played kind of more advanced city simulators. Mm -hmm. um, so the only three kind of demographics of people in this game are low income, medium income, and high income individuals. Um, there are no demographics beyond that. So it's a very reductive okay. kind of understanding sure. of the game. And at this point, we have kind of people, medium wealth residential, they want houses. Um, and so we've started to zone residential in these areas. Um, and again, it's extremely high level, rudimentary. It, I imagine that the, um, the program that you're running for these uh, students is even more advanced than this. So um, that's kind of the state of things as of now. And uh, we haven't even provided um, police, fire, nothing like that. This city is extremely vulnerable. <laughs> and right. uh, yeah, that's that's basically the state of things. Um, so I'll kind of click around in here and uh, sure, sure. show, show well, I you guess, some things. I guess maybe, oh, you want to show me some more stuff? Yeah, oh, no, 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 go ahead. Um, and so yeah, it's just we don't have enough medium wealth people and um, basic, basic city services are not being provided. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, well, I, I mean, it's a, it, interesting, and I and I will just say right up front, uh, I'm not a planner, uh, despite uh, with an organization that that includes a lot of planners. They're one of our biggest demographics, but uh, uh, and I'm also not a, a Sim City uh, expert. So uh, I'm 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 uh, you got a, you got you got with you a guest that is uh, <laughs> uh, limited in it in in, in his uh, ability to contribute to this. But I mean, a couple of things I would 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 just you know broad lenses I might want to have a look at here is, uh, I mean, on one hand, uh, we, in, if, if, if it's like Toronto, when you think about all that, that low density residential, um, that is, you know, one of, before COVID, that has been, you know, one of our great challenges is the fact that that, that, that low density yellow belt, as we call it, um, has by and large been shrinking in population decade after decade for, for some decades. Um, and it's not um, uh, being uh, able to accommodate the, the population growth that, that really we, you know, we need to accommodate in a city that, that is, as I said, the fastest growing in you know, North America and, and Europe by some measures, a city and region. So I, I worry a little bit about uh, not uh, having uh, um, what you know, some are referring to as the missing middle in, the, in this mix. And I don't know whether uh, any of that could be accommodated. Um, uh, I, I, I fully get in the COVID uh, world that we're in now, um, you know, adding more residential density at a time when people probably are really looking differently at density is is uh, is a, is a challenge. But um, you know, it's it's always going to rub up against uh, you know a, a, an even bigger challenge ultimately, and that's the fact that we need you know we need to move people uh, shorter distances, not longer distances. Um, in, in order to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, considerate of uh, climate change and so forth, and transportation is one of the biggest climate contributors to climate uh, issues. So, so I'd, I'd be I'd be looking at at, at the density very carefully. I'd also be looking at. I, I think if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, that there's not a lot of employment in here, or is there? Uh, currently, um, currently we are exceeding in demand. We are exceeding. Um, you would have industrial for a lot of the employment and commercial. So commercial is there's no demand for that. There's a little demand for industrial uh, job creation, and then so it, high demand it, for it, residential. It it the, the way it's laid out so far, it couldn't support commercial. Is what is what you're telling me? That's right. Yeah. So there's not there's currently not enough population to support more commercial growth. Okay. Um, and there, there, people are not. Uh, there is more gotcha. demand for. Uh, middle so where, income. where are people in this in this community going to work? For example, obviously another place, but uh, broader in the regional context. I guess. So it's currently, a, it doesn't quite make a lot of sense. All of this low density residential, all this green, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. is, um, these individuals are being employed by the blue commercial and the yellow industrial. I see. So there is there is a there's already a fair bit now. Yeah. You can't um, you can't mix that that uh, or can you? Can you get a little more of a mixed use? You know, commercial well, seems to be very segregated. <laughs> it's extremely segregated, and this is actually something that uh, my first guest took umbrage with, which is that not only is it segregated by um, three very highly specific forms of zoning, uh, but mm -hmm. the streets themselves determine the density. So. Um, if you have a four lane road, uh, you right. can have high density, uh, medium street is a little more, and then a low density street. So rather than, um, the way Toronto is set up where density can occur in different ways based on planning and legislation, um, in this case, as the, if the street is wide, it can be high density. If the street is narrow, it can be low density. Gotcha. Um, and what about medium? Um, what about that? that in between because uh, I can see uh, tell me show me where you're at with uh, medium density how how much of this community is uh, kind of in that that pocket because so, I sort of see okay this is the height this is our um, currently almost everyone is at low density so that's the kind of white buildings here and if the buildings turn blue they're at high or medium so there is not a single medium or high density building in this city yet everything is low density well, I'd be, I mean, I'd be inclined to, to, to see some medium density where there may be some opportunities. Uh, uh, you know, obviously the favorite opportunities are usually around main streets and so forth. But I mean, even uh, encroaching into uh, uh, a few properties into off a of main street, Vancouver's looking at, at, at encouraging um, uh, higher intensification uh, just a little bit into the neighborhood, if not deep into the neighborhood. Um, so, so go ahead. So in this game, the way to do that, basically all of these bars are representative of the fact that these people are not going to densify their neighborhoods. And as it progresses from red to green, it's more likely that they will expand. And so much like in Toronto, if you start to provide amenities, I'm about to place a park. These bars start okay. to change colors, little happy faces, and these bars start to grow. And once they okay. start to go green, then you start to see actual, you know, um, you know, let's okay. say this is kind of like the equivalent of uh, putting in that dog fountain. Um, right. Yeah. Berksy Park. Berksy Park. And you add such a thing here and those smiling faces. Right. Right. Well, I think that's uh, definitely, uh, I think public realm <laughs> is, is one of those things post COVID we're going to be. Um, putting an increased high premium on. I think that uh, uh, right now, I think people are really recognizing, um, you know, just the incredible uh, amount of, of uh, load that our, our, our downtown parks uh, and streets are, are, are taking. Now, that's an unusual situation that we're in right now, but nonetheless, it's maybe exposing um, some of the... Uh, uh, challenges we have around public realm. I was uh, been I've been out, you know, sort of in the outer edges of the city a couple of times in the last two weeks, going for walks where there is more space and and you know it's easier to get that that social distancing in in, in those circumstances. Social distancing may not be a forever ever phenomenon for us, of course, we hope not. But but many are suggesting that uh, um, you know it's it probably is uh, something that we're going to see more waves of in our lifetime, and so. Uh, that I think is going to highlight uh, uh, some of that, that need. Um, so um, give me some other, uh, let me, I'm, again, I'm just sort of uh, uh, trying to absorb my uh, opportunities to uh, <laughs> contribute to what you've got here. Yeah, um, yeah. What are, where is mass transit uh, in your... Uh, uh, it has not yet been instituted. So we are at um, the stage in the game where uh, we can have uh, bus, a bus system put in. And here again, there comes a, you know, a, something I've been talking to guests about is kind of the biases of this game. So in this case, mm -hmm. um, we can start to provide buses, um, mm -hmm. but buses will only stop for low and medium wealth sims. So the idea being essentially that um, buses only service middle class and below. Uh, and then this goes to uh, park and rides for low and medium wealth sims. 
and then um okay so 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 are you telling me that do we have enough density to support we have do we have enough to support a bus or or that's and that's not as far as we can go yeah. or or do we have more because uh, it seems to me if if the answer is we can only support a bus um then that's not the answer uh you know even even in a suburban context uh you know surely we are needing to build everything that could handle some level of rail transit yeah uh so at this point we have not built our city large enough for a rail uh but we would be able to do streetcars well streetcars are yeah. are maybe in the context of what you're developing is is uh so what do we need in order to uh, get ourselves into the streetcar uh, zone? What are we? So I'm just going to quickly yeah. fast forward. So basically we're making, the idea here is we're making $2,600 per hour. We need 30 grand of, uh, I think they refer to them as SIM dollars or simoleons or something. Okay. Uh, so we'll just quickly kind of ramp up the uh, speed at which things are progressing. Uh, and hopefully we can generate enough income in that time. Before, you have okay. to, uh, before we need to close this call. Yeah, sure, um, I realize. But while I'm while I'm kind of just speeding yeah. this world along, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, are you planning anything? Is the ULI planning anything in terms of kind of uh, thought leadership or community building during this time that uh, you're kind of yes. able to share? Yeah. Yeah. No, we're we're um, we're doing we're wrapping up. Um, one thing we can do, uh, uh, and we do, you know, already. You know, for those of you who, who uh, suffer from the emails that 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 we send, so many of uh, you would know that we uh, we do do a lot of programming in normal times. Um, in fact, last year we did uh, uh, upwards of eighty programs uh, in one year um, with over ten thousand people attending them. So that's you know sort of over a hundred people per event, which is more than one a week. So we do we, we're prolific in in that department in normal times. We're going to take that even further uh, in these uh, times where we can't actually physically get together. Um, already, we've begun uh, a number of, of, of webinars. There'll be more launched. We're probably going to be at two or three a week. Um, some of those webinars are going to be partnership. We're, we're, we're looking to be, we're starting a, a pilot, but probably a series with Ryerson uh, City Building Institute, um, probably one a week, looking at, at various future scenarios post-COVID. Um, we're also um, um, looking to do another series that, that, that leverages our membership. Um, some of them operate more locally, some of them operate uh, more globally. This Friday, for example, Friday, that we guess that's April, what is that, the um, third, um, is uh, at lunchtime. We've got uh, Peter Ballin from CPPIB and Lisa Bate from B Plus H Architects uh, uh, giving different perspectives on uh, how they see um, the global impact of, of uh, this COVID uh, public uh, health crisis we're in uh, on uh, real estate. Um, uh, and um, we're going to be looking at this on a more local context in the upcoming uh, weeks as well as to how uh, the business climate is, is being affected uh, um, by this uh, environment that we're in. So we've, 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 um, and those are just a, you know, a couple of examples. There's so many uh, different lenses. Um, we did a survey of our members uh, about, you know, 15, 20 topics, um, COVID related, not COVID related. Um, and there's, there's just tremendous amount of thirst for uh, understanding. Um, wh what does this mean? Um, and we need to service that understanding. And what does this mean in week one and versus week three or five or you know month four is 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 going to change? I think we're in perhaps the most uncharted uh, territories that we've ever been in. Um, but uh, somehow that sort of sweet, speaks to the sweet spot of of ULI. We were we were born in the middle of of the Great Recession in 1936. Um, and so in in essence, in our DNA, dealing with economic challenge is really um, what we're about, and uh, so we're gonna we're gonna play to that strength. I think as we go through this uh, this COVID uh, challenge right now. Awesome. I um I kind of got my start in architecture marketing with uh, B plus H actually. I know Lisa quite well, so uh, oh great. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I I really like uh, what she has to say. That's really cool. Perfect. Well, she's also subject of a a podcast that's uh, going out tomorrow on on our channels at uh, ULI as well and uh, um, that's another really awesome series that we've uh, we've had now about uh, uh, four 
um, um, different seasons, uh, uh, moving on to season five, I think, um, um, led by Jeremy Warson, who's uh, with uh, Infrastructure Ontario. I don't know if people aren't familiar with that. Uh, it's called Electric Cities. Um, but it's a, it's a really, really uh, interesting session. And Lisa was actually being um, uh, interviewed for what was to have been a, um, uh, a climate-focused uh, um, uh, a topic, and it really shifted into a COVID-focused topic, and that's going out tomorrow. So that could be interesting. Awesome, yeah. I mean, um, I think I was at, at, at the meeting where uh, Jeremy was first talking about that, uh, that podcast, and it's been great to literally hear it grow. <laughs> Yeah, as time has gone on, it's it's really really cool. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to quickly place the streetcar. We're running a little bit low on time. Um, I know. So we'll do a we'll do maybe an east west uh, streetcar track, um, kind of anticipating future development up here. I mean, uh, Toronto's no future to uh, no stranger to um, creating transit stations in places where that density is anticipated. <laughs> so let's. Uh, We'll kind of set this up for the next uh, okay. guest. And I have spent all my money laying down track with not enough money for a station, which... Uh, you know, build happened. it, they will come. Build it, they will come. So <laughs> exactly. uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we, can, we can live with that. We can live with that. Um, but I think uh, there's probably been very few examples where, uh, you know, you've uh, laid down some smart infrastructure that didn't... Uh, uh, ultimately trigger some of the development. Even if you think about Shepherd Subway, uh, you know, it's still perhaps not the most uh, uh, viable piece of infrastructure, but I think, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, considerable development uh, along that corridor and when it gets looped at some point to, uh, to Scarborough and then heads further west, I think, you know, it will have proven a, a good investment. Ultimately, uh, hopefully uh, we could say the same about the Scarborough subway. I don't know. Um, that one seems a little more challenging to imagine um, its uh, long-term viability, but uh, uh, I'm content with uh, with putting putting our bets on on transit, even in this uh, world of, of social distancing. Yeah, absolutely. Richard, uh, thank you so much. I think I think I'm going to have to call it just because I, I yeah. have to run to a two o'clock. But um, thanks so much for uh, for stopping by and chatting. I'm I'm really kind of just enjoying chatting with different folks and kind of showcasing what people are up to during these uh, challenging and um, you know, interesting times. A great honor to do this. Thanks so much for asking. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Bye bye. See ya.